You can be seated if you'd like to there. Uh, also, if you need a Bible, there are some near the, the front over here, or there are some uh, uh, near the uh, sound booth. Please grab your Bibles and open them up to uh, the book of Esther. Esther uh, chapter 2 is where we find ourselves this morning. Before we jump into that, I feel like I have to apologize to you. Uh, because my face feels kind of naked, um, I gave my wife a uh, uh, an anniversary present, and uh, part of it worked uh, because she said, "Now it's too short." This is this was too long at one point, and now because I was able to grow my beard out much longer, now she looks at it and says, "It's too short," and so I feel like I won actually. So um, we're we're moving the right direction, and I'll I'll get it a little thicker here in a little bit. Anyway, just weird personal stuff with me. Uh, Esther chapter 2 is where we find ourselves together today. Have you ever um, paid attention to those commercials for uh, different kinds of uh, medications or drugs that you can take, uh, and you listen to the guy at the end that talks really, really, really fast? Um, it's like this, I have a friend, uh, you met him, his name's Scott, he lives in Arizona, a friend of mine. Uh, we, we would always joke about these things, and some of them are just absolutely terrible side effects, and you wonder... Would, why would you even take this? Are, are you kidding? You're going to trade whatever issue you have for this? And, and so it's just crazy that this is the way that, that these things work. I mean, they promise to make life better. They promise to make <coughs> things change. And they promise to whatever issue or problem you have, we'll get rid of it. But there might be some of these other things. And so I kind of looked up a couple of them. I, I wanted to tell you about a couple of them. Uh, and, uh, and just, you know, some of the side effects of them. So Chantix is a, an anti-smoking one, right? And so the whole thing with that is take this and you'll, this little blue pill or whatever, and you'll stop smoking. Well, what they, what they say about this is that you're, you, some of the things that you can have as far as side effects is nausea, sleep disturbance, flatulence. This is in there. I didn't make this up. This is, I didn't want to write that in there. Vomiting. Uh, and then one of them is suicide ideation, meaning that you like fantasize about killing yourself. You might quit smoking, but you might fantasize about killing yourself. And part of the reason for this is because when it says, it says, uh, um, uh, what does it say? Bad dreams? Oh, sleep disturbance. What it should say is psychotic nightmares. Because when you read about what these people are having dreams about, it's literally, it, it seems to me like demonic oppression. That's what I read. It seems craziness. Okay. So you might stop smoking, but you might die. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's another one. Here's one. Uh, this one has crazy amounts. I actually had to narrow down the side effects of this one because there were so many. So I just had to pick a few of them. Uh, Accutane, this is for acne. So if you got uh, bad pimples, uh, then you could take this one. But you might uh, have a depressed mood. Uh, the teenagers have that anyway. Sleep problems, um, crying spells, hallucinations, thoughts of suicide or hurting yourself, blurred vision, hearing loss. Like you don't have pimples, but you might not hear anymore. Um, seizures, severe pain in your upper stomach spreading to your back, nausea, vomiting, jaundice. Jaundice could happen like, okay, you're, you're going to turn yellow. Um, uh, severe diarrhea, rectal bleeding, fever, chills, body aches, like, basically like the flu, easy bruising or bleeding, purple spots under your skin, bone pain or fracture. Your bones might break from not having, but you won't have pimples. <laughs> like, this is, this is crazy, right? Like this is, this is insane of some of this stuff that's going on. And, and, and when you think about this, these things are, they're trading one problem for another. And, and that's exactly what the road of compromise is in the Christian life. When you compromise your walk with the Lord, you are obtaining something, but you're paying a price in order to get that thing that you're looking to, to, to gain. You see, uh, when you compromise, you're going to experience a ton of side effects in your pursuit of the thing that you want to get. And compromise, when it happens, it happens because it promises you something. And, and the, the reason that there's a real temptation in this is because you'll probably get what you want through compromise. You'll probably get it. But there's an issue involved in that because there's a toll that it takes on your life. Now, as I think through this idea of compromise, there are at least four different things or reasons why we compromise. Four things that we want in order to obtain, and this is why we compromise. And they are, uh, I wrote them up there, there you go. Uh, you can write them down if you'd like to, but acceptance. 
I want to be accepted. I want to be taken into this group or into this uh, uh, area of life. I want to be accepted. And so I'm willing to compromise on my walk with the Lord in order to receive this acceptance. Uh, another one could be opportunity. That if I compromise my walk with the Lord, it opens up the door of opportunity for whatever it is. Advancement at work, uh, a chance to, to, to get this thing that I want, whatever it happens to be. Pleasure is a huge one. That, that in order to get the pleasure that I want, I have to compromise my walk with the Lord. There's a big temptation involved in that. And then finally is escape. I just want to get out of the situation and issues and problems that I have in life. And so I'm willing to compromise my walk with the Lord in order to obtain that escape. And like we said before, the reason that these are real and valid and very strong temptations is because they usually can actually give you what you're looking to get. But the problem is that it takes a toll on your life. It's like when you're trying to, to drive home and Google Maps, unless you click that little button that says turn toll roads off, it's going to route you to the toll road every time. I think there's some sort of racket going on. That no matter where you are, it's going to say, take all these roads to get to the toll road, right? And it's always trying to get you to get to the toll road to pay the money. And if you get on the toll road, you're going to get home faster. For sure, you're going to get home faster. But it's going to cost you. And so, you know, the tolls keep going up around here. And if you're down south in Centennial or something, you want to come all the way up here. And you can take the toll road, but it's going to cost you about $2.3 million. Um, <laughs> they're going to build 15 roads as a result of you driving that once. But uh, the thing of this is just, is just really crazy. The promise is that, uh, the problem is that compromise leads you to a toll road where the price is not disclosed. You don't know what you're going to pay. You might think about what, the, what you're going to pay. You might try to figure out, well, I'm willing to pay this, so I think this compromise is okay. But you don't know what you're going to end up paying on this toll road. It's going to lead you down this toll where uh, there are multiple withdrawals, withdrawals from the account of your soul. It's not just going to be that one toll. It's going to be multiple tolls that it takes upon your life. And so when we think about this concept and this idea of compromising my walk with the Lord, the big thing that we've got to get is, it's just not worth it. However hard it is to follow the Lord, however much it's going to cost you to pursue Him, however much it takes for you to stay honorable and godly in your walk and your relationship with Him, it's not worth breaking your bones in order to not have pimples anymore. It's just not worth it. So don't do it. The compromise isn't worth it when it comes to walk your walk with the Lord. So here's our big idea. Keep this in mind as we go through Esther 2 today. It says, it's this. Compromise always takes away more than you hope to gain from it. Compromise always takes away more than you hope to gain from it. So whatever you're hoping to gain, whatever you think you're going to get, you may end up getting it, but the cost is far too high. It's going to take from you more than you think. So this week we're going to take a look at Esther 2, and we're going to break it down into uh, three sections together today. Verses 1 through 8 is this, that compromise is costly. And then verses 9 through 18, that God positions Esther. And then verses 19 through 23, God positions Mordecai. So let's look at this first piece in verses 1 through 8, that compromise is costly. Esther chapter 2 verse 1 says this, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what, he, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai the king's eunuch uh, custodian of the women and let beauty preparations be given to them then the young woman who pleases the king uh, be queen uh, then let the, the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti and this thing pleased the king and he did so 
You see here, we, we, as we open up chapter 2 of the book of Esther, it starts with this whole idea uh, of after these things. You see that there in verse 1? After these things. This is after what we talked about last week in chapter 1, that, uh, th- that Xerxes, which is King Ahasuerus, he throws this massive party for six months, and he does so in order to gain the approval and the backing of all of the the people who are lords over the different regions of his empire. That's vast. It goes from uh, India all the way to Ethiopia. It's the largest empire in human history to this point. And so he gathers all of these officials to the palace uh, this, in, in Shushan, and he has a six-month-long party. And, and the part of this party, the whole point is to gain their approval and their acceptance. And so what happens is, through this, he does. He gains they're backing, and they bring all of their armies along, and they're going to head off to go take out Greece. That's the point. They want to go fight Greece. Uh, and history tells us that they started to win their battle against Greece, but then they were eventually defeated, and he comes back uh, after having been routed and defeated and has to just return home, not taking Greece. This is after these things. So all of this has taken place, and now he's come back home. This is three to four years after chapter one. There's a break uh, of time in the chapters. And in this, we see that it tells us that he remembered Vashti. That Xerxes gains the support. He goes on this, this campaign and, uh, and then ends up coming back as a, a failure in conquest. And no longer distracted with war nor his drunken foolishness to, ban- uh, to banish his wife Vashti. Uh, he now remembers what took place. And it's got him in a bad mood. It says he remembers what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And he's, he's feeling terrible because his conquest didn't work. And then he remembers what happened to his wife. And he, doesn't, he doesn't even have this consolation of his wife to come home to. And now it's occupying his mind and it's making him depressed. And so verse 2, we see the king's servants who attended him said, and they start to come up with this idea. And they, 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 they're essentially in this survival mode. That they see Xerxes is having a bad day, and uh, he's got this problem going on. And so in this, they know that when the king is, an emotion, is emotionally unstable, it's a bad thing for everybody. I mean, this guy made one emotionally charged crazy decision, and now his wife is, is in exile. Uh, so, you know, if he's willing to do that to her, what is he willing to do to us? And so they think, you know, well, we got to do something. we got to get this guy happy again because when he's not happy ain't nobody happy and that's a bad thing for everybody and so they start to figure out what are we going to do with him and they come up with an idea to replace Vashti and and they say uh, let beautiful young virgins be sought from uh, for the king and let him appoint officials in notice it says in verse three all the provinces and so what they say to him is hey let's replace Vashti not with one woman but with every woman let's do that and, uh, and the king is like, that's a great idea. I can't believe I didn't think of this myself. And just like any godless king in a pagan culture, of course he's going to act in an ungodly way. Of course he's going to do what serves him. Of course he's going to look at this and say, I am here as king and all of you are here to serve me. And so whatever thing I think I want or pleasure I think I need, that's what you're there. And so this self-centered, self-indulgent king that's prone to temper tantrums thinks this is a sweet idea. Let's do it. And so from there, they start to trickle down all the leadership uh, in in the surrounding regions of his empire to say, let's gather all the the beautiful young virgins. Look at verse 5. So it's a, it shifts gears now. In Shushan, the citadel, remember this is the capital city, um, and this is uh, it, there where he's, his palace is located. So in Shushan, the citadel, there is a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, or Mordecai, however you would like to say it, I say Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had to be carried away from Jerusalem, had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful, and her father 
Uh, And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was when the king's command and decree were heard, uh, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel under the custody of Haggai, that Esther was also taken to the king's palace to the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. In the middle of this darkness, growing more dark, we have the, the chapter 1 ending in just despair and darkness and things are just bad and getting worse. And now we read in the beginning of chapter 2, things are, they're not getting better. They're getting worse. Stuff's going from bad to worse to worse. And in the middle of all of the darkness growing more and more dark, a single family is brought into focus. And we see that at the head of this family is a man named Mordecai. There in verse 7. That Mordecai is brought to the surface for us to see. And essentially what we see is he's a normal man living a normal life. Just kind of living uh, his life and uh, doing normal things. And, and, and in this, he's a man of honor and of heart. That's some of the details that were told about him. That his cousin ends up orphaned. That Esther is his cousin. That's his uncle's daughter. She ends up orphaned and he's older and is therefore in a position to be able to care for her. And so here she is, this young girl. Her parents die. She's in a foreign land. And, and Mordecai comes in to rescue her and to take care of her and to bring her in and adopt her as his very own. That he, he, he has this heart of compassion and, and honor to be willing to care for this this little girl who would be destitute without her. I mean, imagine what it would be like if you were, if you were Esther, if you were in her shoes, that you're in this foreign land and your, your parents are now dead and now all of this tragedy has struck and what's going to take place? What is my life going to end up being? And, and here Mordecai comes in to take care of her and to adopt her as his very own daughter. And from here on, uh, essentially we'll be referring to her as Mordecai's daughter because that's the relationship they had for all her, uh, all that she knew and the way that she identified with him was as, as her dad. And this kind of self-sacrificing love for the sake of another is at the very heart of God. This is who He is. He's a sacrificing, loving, caring, adopting kind of God. That, that He takes... He takes us who were his enemies, Romans 5 says. And then he takes his enemies and he makes them his kids. He brings us into his family and he calls us his own. He doesn't leave us on the outside, but he brings us in as his children. He gives us his place and his heritage and his name and his character. That this is at the very heartbeat of who our God is. That he adopts us as his father. Romans 8.15 says this, It says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. But God makes you his own. And then when we see Mordecai doing this and going out of his way and taking her and she can't do anything for him. She can't bless him at all. She doesn't give him anything. There's no benefit to having uh, her as, as daughter It's just because of His honor, of His love, of His desire. And so too it is with us. There's nothing you can do to make yourself attractive to the Lord. There's nothing that you can do to say, God, you you should love me more. You should should want me on your team. I mean, I, I love me. You should too. Let me tell you about all the great things that I can do for you, God. No, there's there's none of that within our relationship with God. He alone has His love and His identity is given to us. And so we see that she is, um, she is uh, uh, adopted by Mordecai. But notice what we see about her. Not only in verse 7 do we see Mordecai, but we also see some details about Esther. It says uh, to us there that uh, he had brought up Hadassah. Hadassah, that would be her, that'd be her given name. This is her Hebrew name. Hadassah, it's the, it's the word uh, myrtle tree. In, in Hebrew, and essentially what this is speaking of, you can look up in, in, in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 55, talks about the, this myrtle tree, this Hadassah tree, uh, and, and the whole concept of it is speaking of God's provision and ability and His grace uh, being over 
uh, their lives. It's His promised provision and grace. And, and yet, her name is, she doesn't go by Hadassah, she goes by Esther, and that's her Persian name. And that, that means star. What this reveals for us a little bit is something that's going on within the heart of Esther. Something that's taking place within her heart. It shows us that she has a Hebrew heritage, but she's forsaking that because of the cost of it, because she doesn't want to identify with her, with her God. She wants to identify with the world. And so she takes on a common name. She takes on a Persian name, and that's what she's known as. And this, this book is even titled after that Persian name. This book is even uh, the from here on out. This is what she's referred to as. We don't, we don't refer to her as Hadassah any longer. It's always Esther. And so in this, we see that she's trading her heritage in the Lord for acceptance in the world. This word uh, Esther uh, uh, means star. And that her identity being hidden, she's trading her godly heritage for her worldly pursuits, living for herself. That star is this idea that I'm, I'm exalting myself and I'm living for me and I, I just want everything to be about me and that this is kind of what's wrapped up within the heart of, of Esther, of Hadassah, that she's abandoned her godly heritage to pursue the world's pursuit because that's what happens when compromise takes place. The Galatians 6 tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. What that is, is it's this baking thing. So if you bake, you know what this is. Leaven is a, the agent that causes the bread to rise. And, and essentially what it is, is it's, uh, it's this thing that causes the bread to decay. It, it, it goes into the dough and it begins to decay. And if, and if you catch it at a certain point, uh, then it doesn't decay too badly and go bad. It just makes the bread, the bread rise and get real light and fluffy. And I mean, there's nothing like a beautiful piece of warm sourdough bread. Because you know, it's got those giant holes in it. And you can rub all that butter in there and it fills it up. It's like a pool of butter. It's just glorious. But the way that that, that hole gets there is from decay. Because there's a little thing that goes into the bread and it eats the bread. And it... it it emanates gas, and that's what causes the hole. So there you go, and then you're like, I can't eat that anymore. Um, so it's, that's what's making that hole take place. It's because it causes that to happen. Now, when you put leaven into a lump of dough, it doesn't just stay in one corner. It's not like half, you know, just one corner rises in the bread, and that's it. It permeates the entire lump. That's what it does. When you allow compromise into your life, it permeates every area of your life. You can't keep it in the corner. You can't keep it in the closet. It's not going to stay hidden away. It's not going to just stay over there and not affect anything in, uh, in your life. It's, it's going to come out. It's going to take more. It's going to permeate every aspect of your life. And this is where we find them. That, that, that Mordecai and Esther, though, though there's this godliness that's in their lives, they're living in compromise. If you remember from last week, they're part of the, the 97% of Israel that did not go back to Jerusalem, were not obedient to the Lord. And so they find themselves in this position of compromise. And now because they're even there in that, pl that place, now we read here in verse 8 that Esther was taken into the, the king's palace. That, that this broad sweeping taking of all of these girls. And Esther's caught up in the middle of all of it. She had been positioned incorrectly. Disobedience and compromise and self-serving had positioned her to where when the enemy did his work, she got swept up in it too. And now here she finds herself. Look at the word there. Look at, look at verse 8. It says, Esther was also taken. She was pulled out by force. She was ripped away from her family and placed with the king into the king's harem. And we're going to read here that this is, this is something pretty tragic and pretty terrible of what's going on here. That her, her identity is hidden and this compromise brings her there. That Mordecai here is living in the terrible middle. One foot in the world, one foot in the Lord. And, and his decision to live that way has now affected his daughter. Your, your compromise doesn't just affect you. 
It will never just stay with you. You're, ne- you're never just hurting yourself. Some people like to use that as an excuse for their sin. I'm not hurting anybody. Yeah, you are. You may not be able to see it. You may not be able to identify it. You may not even know what it's going to cost you years down the road. But that decision is going to hurt other people. And it is hurting other people right now. And so you've got to decide, I will not compromise. I will not go that way. Even though it promises to give me something, I will not take it. I'm going to pursue the things of the Lord. And Esther here is taken. His compromise didn't just affect him. It affected her as well because of this terrible middle. He wouldn't be in the world or in the Lord. He was just stuck in this no man's land, this this vast expanse of nothingness. And here in the middle of all this, Esther is taken. Notice that the there were a couple of different things that were the qualifiers for these girls to be taken. It's uh, verse 2, let beautiful young virgins be taken. That was the qualifiers. And notice there in verse 8 that Esther was taken. And that's because compromise, we'll put this on the screen for you, compromise will take your virtue and your innocence. It will take your virtue. It will take your innocence. When you compromise your walk with the Lord, you're you're not going to be able to hold on to your virtue. You're not going to be able to hold on to your innocence. It will be stolen. It will be taken away from you. When I think about this, I think about my own life and just different stupid things that I did. I mean, I'm sure... Well, you probably don't have any stories like this, but I'll tell you one. Um, when I was in, in high school, I was uh, basically growing up, I was basically the good kid. You know the kid that all of the parents wanted their, uh, their, their kids to be the friend of? That was me. I was always nice to the parents. I was always kind to them. I would always say good things in front of them. But inside, my heart was filled with evil and stupidity. But outside, I was able to make it look nice. And so uh, I was able to kind of pass along this lie, even though I knew inside there was, this, there was this terribleness. And within me, one of the biggest things that I wanted, one of the greatest things that I wanted growing up was, was acceptance. I wanted to be accepted. And so uh, that's a dangerous thing, especially as a teenager. Because when the wrong people come into your life, then you're willing to do stupid things uh, in order to gain their acceptance. And so I had this friend, and we both worked at a, a retail store, and I was the cart guy. You know, the guy that goes out and grabs the carts. And so that was, my, that was my job. I went out and got the carts. Um, and one day I was out pushing carts around, and he came outside, and he said, Hey, I was just in the break room. And one of the other employees left their locker open and they just cashed their check. Look at all this money I have. And he said, Micah's like, you never told me this story. (laughs) And he goes, I need somewhere to put it. Can I put it in your truck? And in that moment, I knew within me, I have a decision to make. I wanted to say no. I wanted to say that's terrible. How is she going to pay her bills? But in that moment, because I wanted acceptance, I compromised. I compromised. And I said, sure, you can hide it in my truck. And then we divided the money later and went about our merry way. What I didn't realize is that this was going to be a huge, massive turning point in my life. Where I went, uh, within a couple of weeks, I was trying to steal anything and everything I could get my hands on. And because I was the kid that everybody trusted, I had the nice smile, I was able to do it. I stole so much stuff, all sorts of crazy things. Eventually, uh, it caught up to me, and uh, they caught me, and uh, they brought me in, and they fired me. They should have had me arrested, but they didn't. They were, it was just the grace of God. They took took me, and they fired me, and it it completely eradicated and collapsed my my morality because of one small, seemingly insignificant, sure, you can put it in my truck, that one decision collapsed everything. And completely change the course of where my life was headed. See, in that, one bad decision is all it takes to destroy the direction of your life. Compromise is never worth it. It's never worth it. And here in the middle of all this, they're finding themselves in this compromise. And now, the compromise has led where Mordecai most dreaded. This, this little girl who he's given his life for. Who he's raised as his own daughter. Who he's poured everything into she's taken now what 
And he knows exactly what's coming up. He knows exactly where this goes. And all he can do is worry and live in anxiety. Look at verse 9. It says this, Now, the young woman, speaking of Esther, pleased him. Him is Haggai, the, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she found favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her, <coughs> excuse me, and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Esther had not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Again, more compromise. And every day, Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what, had ha what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had uh, completed 12 months of preparation according to the regulations for, for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation apportioned. Six months with oil and myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared... Each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In verse 14, uh, in the evening she went in, uh, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of uh, Shahashgaz, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. The girls here, we see the second piece that God positions in verses uh, 9 through 18. God positions Esther. Now the girls who were taken from across the empire uh, were taken into this first house. There were two houses. The first house was a house of preparation. And then from there they would live in this other house under this other guy, Shahashgaz, uh, where they were part of the king's harem and uh, one of his Concubines. Now, uh, Josephus, who is a, a, an ancient historian, he records that uh, there were 400 girls who were taken at this time. Um, so this isn't just a couple. There were 400 girls that were taken into this. And what would happen to these girls is that they would go in and they would uh, be at this first house, this house of preparation, which was a lot like a spa. Right? You read that? Look at there in verse, uh, uh, verse 12. Uh, she, the days of her preparation were six months with uh, oil of myrrh and six months of perfumes. So a year of living in a day spa. Sounds pretty awesome. Like you just get to soak in awesome stuff and paint stuff. I don't know what girls do. Uh, whatever that is, they, they, they're doing their thing. So we're given these preparation, uh, this beauty preparation for a long uh, day spa for an entire year. And part of this was to prepare them for the king because... They, you know, the king needs the best, right? So let's give them a year of soaking and stuff so they smell awesome. Uh, and then, uh, but the other half of this was, let's, uh, let's make sure that they didn't come to us. Let's make sure they're actually virgins, that they didn't come to us pregnant. This was a real issue, right? There was no, they didn't have pregnancy tests or doctors that could determine this stuff. And so let's just wait and let's see. And so they give them to this house and they would live there for the entire year. And after passing through these beauty preparations, then their turn would come to go to the king. Now, now in this, we read in verse 9 that immediately Esther stands out and she's moved to the front of the line. See that over there in verse 9? She obtained favor, so she readily, uh, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her. She was moved to the front of the line. It, notice what it says there. Besides her allowance, she was given extra she was given more. And then also seven choice maidservants were given to her as well. So the king's palace, she was given some, uh, some uh, uh, girls who would help her and serve her in this. And then also she was moved to the best place in the house. She was given the best room that there's this favor that's on her. And there's this grace that's coming to her. And she's living in this place. And how does all of this take place? How does all of this happen? What we shouldn't see is... Man, it's, stuff's kind of working out for Esther. How, how awesome. No, this is God's providence. This is God positioning her within the house. 
This is God saying, even though you're in a place of compromise, even though you're in a position where things are costing you, even though you are wrecking your own life, I'm still going to pursue you. I'm still going to take care of you. I'm still going to come after you. And so he's pursuing Esther and he's positioning her correctly and he's taking care of her and making sure that she has more than she needs. God's favor and providence is watching over her even as she's taken in and in this bad situation. Psalm 139 verse 16 says this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. That God knew about your life. That God providentially has things orchestrated in order to guide you the way he wants you to go. To bring you to himself. That God knows all of your days. There's nothing you can do that surprises him. There's nowhere you can go that he didn't know already. There's nothing that comes into your life that happens to you that he didn't know about. And he still remains God over it all. That even though Esther finds herself in a bad situation, even though she's taken and ripped from her family, God is still on the throne. God is still good. God is still watching over her. God is still taking care of her. Even in the middle of all this. All this pampering might sound awesome, but but keep in mind what's taking place with these girls. Keep in mind what's happening. This year-long day spa, yeah, that's a cool year, but this is one year out of the rest of their lives. They were taken from their families never to return again. All of the hopes that they would have, all of the dreams, all of the aspirations, all of the desires for their own family to have a husband, to raise children, to be a part of culture and society, gone taken, ripped away. They would never again return to their families. They would never return to society. They were part of the king's harem now. He took all of these girls, stole from their families, stole from their future husbands, stole from their future children that would never be born because of his sick perversion, because of his selfishness and desire for himself. And so they they come in, They're part of one house in order to prepare. They go into the king for one night of sex and then they're uh, they're banished to being part of the concubines. And unless he remembers their name and calls for them, that's just where they live. I mean, how great for them, right? How what an awesome life for them. Take everything taken. And now they get to live with all these other girls. And the one thing they have in common is they shared a boyfriend. Well, that's great. It's just, it's a terrible, terrible thing. It's tragedy. And, and the, the winner, if you want to call her that, gets to be queen. She gets to be queen to this, this child of a man who takes everything that he wants and, and has all these other women on the side when, and, and just treats her terribly. This is, this is a terrible, terrible thing that's taking place here. And here in the middle of all this, Mordecai's compromise deepens. We saw there in verse 10, we we pointed that out, that it says Esther had not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Hey, don't tell them who you are. You're Esther. You're not Hadassah. Don't tell them who you are. Don't reveal your your people. Don't reveal your heritage. His compromise deepens. He lacked faith to go to Jerusalem, and now that faith And that lack of faith is compounding as she's taken. He's not trusting the Lord even more. He's trying to control more and say, let's just don't tell him who you are. We're going to control this situation. We'll get through it. We'll take care of it. And so then in verse 11, every day Mordecai paced in front of the quarters of the women. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the, the weight and burden of guilt that rests upon Mordecai? That he knows she's in this situation because of me. I could have left. I could have done what was right. But I thought I was going to get something. I thought I was going to gain. I thought this compromise wasn't going to be a big deal. And now here I am paying the toll that I never thought I would ever pay. And she's paying it. I'm not. So Mordecai, riddled with grief, riddled with all of this weight and burden, paces in front of the, of the quarters of the women, waiting to see what would happen to her. You see, compromise will take your peace. It it takes your innocence and it takes your peace. You can't have peace when you live in compromise. You can't get it. You're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to have your cake and eat it too. 
You're not going to be able to gain whatever it is that you're looking for and have peace. It'll, it'll be gone from you because compromise takes your peace. Look at verse 15. It says this, Now, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, to go into the king, she requested nothing but uh, what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to, the, to King Ahasuerus, into his royal palace, in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in, the sight, in his sight more than all the, the uh, virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther for all his officials and servants and proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king. You see here, Esther's turn comes in to go to Xerxes. All of the women are going. A year has passed. Mordecai's pacing, wondering what's going to happen. And now, after this long year of waiting, Esther's turn comes. And she goes into the king. And as she goes in, we're told two things in verse 15 about her. Notice it says there that she requested nothing but what uh, Haggai advised. And then secondly, that she obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. What we see here is that there's this subtle shift taking place here in the book of Esther. It's been darkness upon darkness upon darkness upon darkness until this moment. All of a sudden, things seem to be working a little differently. All of a sudden, there's a glimmer of hope. There's something that's taking place a little bit differently. You see, she requested and she obtained. That this is a major shift in the storyline of it all. And we see that she goes in, and she, as she goes into the king, she prepares. She requests some things. And she does so with wisdom. She pays attention to what Haggai, the custodian, says, and she takes what he says she should take. And she didn't do anything else. She took the advice of those who were around her. She was willing to use her mind and to, uh, to engage herself and to do what she could in order to position herself the best way she could. And yet, notice what it says there, Esther obtained favor. This is not that she, she got it for herself, but this is the grace of God, the providence of God, that, that she's given this by the Lord. For us, what we see in this is that this is something that we can take for ourselves and say, this is the way that I can live my life. I need to plan like it all depends on me. I need to engage my mind and God gave me a brain. I should use it. He's given me gifts and skills and abilities. I should do what I can. But we've got to not only plan like it depends on me, but pray like it depends on God. <clears throat> plan like it depends on me, but have faith like it all depends on Him. Because unless God does something, even in my smartest, best ability, I still can't make it happen. It's got to be God's grace meeting up with my willingness in order to make this thing, these things come about. Faith that works is faith that works. Right? A faith that works is the faith that works. It's not just sitting back and saying, God, take care of it. You better figure all this out. I don't know what to do. No, you do what you can. But you trust God with every aspect of it. Trusting that He's going to direct your path. And so again in verse 16, we see that she was taken. See that there? Esther was taken to the king. Same word, same concept. What this is telling us is that this is not her plan. This isn't what she wants. She isn't positioning herself here trying to say, I'm going to win the beauty contest. You know, it's like Bachelor, Babylon 8, 480 BC or whatever. Like that's not the plan. It's not what's going on. Okay? <laughs> She doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want to win this contest. She doesn't want to be anywhere a part of this. She's being taken and taken and taken. And now here she is. She's just in the middle of this, going down this toll road, and the toll is being taken upon her soul and upon Mordecai's soul. And it appears, this word appears taken, showing us the drastic nature of how all this is unfolding. And she doesn't want to be there. Now, even in this, notice verse 17. It says, The king loved Esther, Notice the next few words, more than all the other women. And she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins. Even his profession of love, if that's what you want to call it, for her, is, is tainted and muddied by this whole idea of the other women. It's like if I was to say, Micah, hey, I, I think you're, you're more beautiful than my girlfriends. 
Like, that's probably not going to work out very well for me, right? And if any of you know Micah, I'm probably going to get shot. Like, that's not going to work out well. This is, this, that's, that's, not, that's, not very, that's not very complimentary to her. Oh, I love you more than all my other girlfriends. Even in all this, his profession of love is, is muddied by the phrase more than the other women. And it's not instead of them. It's not this, this idea when you, when you stand at the altar of marriage, you're saying, I'm abandoning all these other women in order to, per, to give myself to you. It's, it's this mutually exclusive thing. No, for him, it's like, well, I got all these other girls on the side, but I like you. You're, you're the hottest of them all, so I guess you can be queen. Like, it's just craziness that's going on here. Now, in all of this, God is positioning Esther by his divine providence. How did she become queen? We shouldn't see she's really attractive. We should see God's putting her there. God is prov- providentially placing her there. Notice what Proverbs 21.1 says. <clears throat> it says this, The king's heart is like the streams of water directed by the Lord. He guides it where he pleases. Now, just a word of caution. I hope this is coming through. But this should give us no confidence, no confidence to live in compromise. To just roll the dice and see how it all works. That, that this, should, this should give us no confidence to presume upon the grace of God. That it, it worked out for Esther, it'll work out for me. No. We should see that she's being taken and that this is painful and that this is where she should not be and that even in the middle of all of it, God is still gracious and kind and good and taking care of her, even though foolishness has brought her here. So this should give us no confidence in the flesh. This should give us no desire to say, well, I'm going to roll the dice and see how it all happens, but, but that we should see God is so good to Esther. She doesn't deserve this grace, and yet God is so good to her. Now, thirdly and finally, this one will be a little bit more quick because it's a a shorter section, verses uh, 19 through 23, God's position of Mordecai, God positioning Mordecai. Verse 19, when the virgins gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Than and Teresh, doorkeepers, uh, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed. And both were hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So we have this really brutal ending to chapter 2, right? It's, it's like, things are getting better. Oh, no, never mind. It's terrible. Uh, it's kind of a crazy thing taking place here. Now, in this, verses 19 through 23, we see that Esther's appointment as queen also results in Mordecai being appointed to a position within the government as well. He's given a government job at the king's gate. That God providentially positions Mordecai on staff, and it just so happens that as he's there... He overhears these two guys talking about wanting to take out the king. When it says they wanted to lay hands on him, it was an assassination attempt. That they were organizing and planning an assassination. And so Mordecai is positioned at the king's gate by God's grace. And he just so happens to overhear, just right, just so happens, God's grace, God's providence. He positions him so he overhears what's taking place with these guys. Now this is a very real thing. The, the, if... if memory serves me correctly, this king was actually assassinated later on in life, okay? So this is a problem. A couple of different people within his government uh, end up assassinating him later on in life. And so we see here that this takes place. These guys are organizing this assassination attempt and this plot against the king, but God gave Mordecai the information. Now put yourself in Mordecai's shoes for just a minute. You've got this information. You could be thinking one of two things. I want Xerxes dead too. He took my daughter. This selfish, childish, foolish man baby should die. I'm in. Let's do it. Right? That very easily could have been his mind. That very easily could have been where he was at. Or he could have honored his position and honored the office of the king even though he didn't agree with the morality of the king. See, he had a moment of decision. Will I continue down the road of compromise? Or will I begin to trust in the Lord and honor God and act in faith toward Him? 
And we see that he chooses to act in faith in the Lord. Notice what it says, and this is something I'm sure that was ringing in the ears of Mordecai as he was thinking through this. Deuteronomy chapter 32, this is the law of the Lord, and it says this, The Lord says, Am I not storing up these things, sealing them away in my treasury? I will take revenge. I will pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip, their day of disaster will arrive, and their destiny will overtake them. That, that here in this moment, Mordecai is faced with the decision, do I take vengeance into my hands, or do I trust God to deal with it? And do I honor the, the office, even though the man is not honorable? And, and for some of us, man, I think that may be a word of the Lord for you. Maybe you've got to serve under somebody who's just not honorable. And opportunities arise for you to attack them or to take them out or to speak badly about them when they're not around or whatever that happens to look like. And, and, and the Lord is calling you to honor their office even though they are not honorable. There's nothing honorable that we read about Xerxes at all. And yet he chooses to honor his office because he's honoring the Lord. And I think it's something that we need to keep in mind as well. It's, a, it's an act of faith to say, God, you take care of it in your time, in your way. Your ability to deal with it is far greater than mine. And so Mordecai trusts in the Lord's timing and the Lord's judgment and turns these guys in. That Mordecai here is on display with honor and with integrity. And what this is setting the stage for is a contrast. And we're going to get into this contrast a little bit more next week. That Mordecai is being set up for us in the hero's position. And next week we're going to get into the villain's position. And they're going to be contrasted against one another in this story, in this narrative. Now, these two guys planning the assassination, notice it says that they were executed. It says in verse 23, they were hanged on a gallows. Now, when you think that, you think of, of being hanged around your neck. That's not what this meant. The Persians didn't do that. What the Persians did was they found a big tree and they cut the top off and they sharpened it like a giant pike. And then they would take the guy, they would sit him on it, and they would get two other guys to pull down on each of his legs. Imagine that kind of splinter. And it goes right through him, okay? That's what it meant for them to be hanged on a gallows. This is, yeah, you're like, thanks for telling me that. I, I could have just read past that. Appreciate it, bro. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah, have a great lunch, guys. Um... He's, so this is what happens to these guys. The king is getting a, a, a really big uh, message across. Don't cross me. If I have a bad day, you have a really bad day. Right? That's what's going on here. And so in all of this, these guys are, are really, really being uh, uh, dealt with in a brutal manner. Now this chapter ends with br br brutality, but there's glimmers of hope throughout it that things are starting to look a little brighter as you can clearly see God's hand orchestrating in the middle of the chaos. You clearly God, you see God positioning the pieces on the playing field. And that God is intervening in the middle of it all. People are doing their things, they're making their plans, they're making their decisions, and yet God is directing events to bring about His plans. That's what's taking place. People are acting like God doesn't exist, and He's still orchestrating things to go the direction He wants them to go. God positions Esther for favor in Haggai, with Haggai. God positions Esther as queen with Xerxes. God positions Mordecai as an official. And then God positions Mordecai to hear what's taking place. God is clearly on the move. And he's clearly putting all of these pieces together. Proverbs 16.9 says this. The mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Do you live that way? Do you genuinely submit your life to the Lord that way? Yeah, plan your way. Do what, engage your mind. Do what you can. But do you trust that the Lord is directing your steps? I would encourage you that when you write your plans down, write them in pencil. God might change them. If you get too, too attached to your stuff and your way and it should go this way and it should be like this, then, then you end up getting mad at God because He's going to change it. He's going to mess all your plans up because He's bringing you about His plan. He's not interested in doing your thing. He's interested in, in doing his thing in your life. And when, the sooner we get on board with that, the sooner that we abandon compromise and go after the things that he deems right and appropriate. God is directing your path. Though in the moment, it might be hard to see 
what everything's doing. It might, it might just look like things are working out. You might not see God. I'm sure they didn't see God in the middle of this. I'm sure that as they were going through this, that just kind of seemed like life and little details of stuff working out. But as they look back, they can clearly see. And as we look back, we can clearly see the hand of God. And in our lives, we've got to trust and believe. God is on the throne. He is working it out. He is leading my life. The question is, will I follow where He is leading me by faith? The cost of compromise is too high because it leads you away from the gracious providence of God down the toll road of your soul's destruction. And yes, God will be mercifully providential in your life because He stays faithful. But the difference is, what is the cost What's the price you're going to pay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and the chance to study it together and just to, to look into what you have to say to us through this amazing book of Esther. We pray that you would help us to draw near to you and to be willing to abandon our compromise in order to pursue you wholeheartedly. Lord, the only regret that I have is uh, that I didn't follow you sooner. And as I've walked with you, the only regrets that I've had is that I didn't trust you in the middle of it all. God, help us. Give us faith. Show us how we can trust you. Give us the courage to follow you, even when it looks hard, and even when it looks like it's going to cost, and even when things don't look like they're going to work out the way we want them to. You're good, and you're God, and you're able, and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.